Buffer Overflow. That is a very classic attack that, well, gets discussed very early on in your CS life. And in fact, as you progress upwards, you may find that, well, this term keeps coming up and perhaps it even gets discussed in more and more detail. It's a very interesting sort of quaint little attack. So what we're going to do is today, we're going to try and understand a little bit more about buffer attacks. Then we're actually going to write some code to see this in action. Yes, we're actually going to try and do a little buffer overflow thing just to see that it is indeed, you know, something that can happen. And then we'll finally go on to take a look at a little safeguard that could potentially tell us when a buffer overflow has actually occurred. So yeah, that's basically what's going to happen for today's Random Wednesday episode. Let's go ahead and jump in. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. So just a little contents page for what's going to happen today. First, I'm going to be discussing a little bit of the theory you know, behind why a buffer overflow can even happen. This one really goes down into the basics, right? So yeah, if you have a rough idea already, you may want to skip that part. So timestamps are available in the video description for you to do that. Our second part will be a basic demonstration. I will be building buffer overflow in the C programming language, and we will just sort of see it happen. In this part, we'll take a look at two different ways in which buffer overflows can be exploited to overwrite data. Finally, we'll move on to take a look at a safeguard that could potentially be used to protect ourselves from this. Again, we'll return to our code and try and implement that, you know, to see it in action. And yeah, with that, we will wrap up the episode. So that is what we're going to be doing for the day. With that said, let us go ahead and jump into our episode. As it turns out, the fundamental concepts behind buffer overflow is fairly simple. Right, and we're going to sort of go into the deep end first, where we look at very low level details. Once we understand that, we can move back to programming terms. The idea is when you create variables within a program, well, these variables are simply placed in RAM. RAM is addressed, that is how you can actually find where your information is, where you can actually store and retrieve them. And yeah, basically all kinds of information could simply be sitting side by side, you know, potentially sensitive information. Normally this isn't a very huge problem and the reason being, well, our programming language is acting as a gatekeeper. It will only access and overwrite the things that is programmed to access and overwrite. Things become more complex when an array comes into the picture. So we're moving on to our higher level programming terms now. The idea is, let's say you create an array of five items. What your programming language is doing is it's going into RAM and basically allocating five spaces, you know, five contiguous spaces and basically saying, all right, this is going to be my array. However, what it remembers is just the first space. Don't forget, you find things in your array by actually, well, mentioning something like this, right? By changing the number, you're actually traversing through the array and in fact, what this number is telling your programming language is how far forward to go from the starting point. So in fact, that number is an offset. The dangerous thing about this is how you can actually change that number to read things beyond the bounds of the array. As you can see later on, we can actually do this for at least a lower level language like C. This is where the danger comes in because, well, we can start to read and even overwrite data that we aren't technically supposed to touch. Now, hopefully this gives you a good enough idea of the mechanics behind the attack. With this picture in mind, let's go ahead and see our demo. So let us begin by writing our C code. Now, C usually starts like this, right? We have our main function. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a variable called secret. So this will be our so-called private information that we will attempt to access. To help us with this, we will also create our array. So let's call this A and uh, let's give it five items. Now, in our diagram earlier, we would have assumed that these two things are stored side by side in RAM. But in actual case, that is, well, not necessarily how things work. So what this means is we do need to do a little bit of trial and error to actually see where the secret is relative to where the array itself is. Now. Let's go ahead and uh, do a print function, right, to show us just some information. 
Now, let's do something completely innocent and okay first, which is to actually show us the first item within the array. So going over to our console, we will go ahead and compile our program. And when we run it, we will of course see, well, the actual value that we are looking for. Since this is a proper use case, everything is going to be fine. Now, there is nothing stopping us from changing this number to say 5, which of course goes beyond the right bound of the array. And now we're reading back some number 0. I have no clue who is actually using this number 0, but well, that is data that I'm not supposed to access. Of course, we want to find our secret. So what we can do is we can just keep changing this value, right? we can just keep going forward until we see the value of the secret we want to find. So I'm just going to go a few steps forward here. Now, I've actually done this experiment several times, so I should have an idea of where it's going to appear. There you go, there is 100, right? So we had to go quite a few steps forward before we could find our number 100. But here's the deal, we're not quite sure if this is the correct number yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say A11, and I'm going to actually assign it to a new value, let's say 500. But to prove that our attack was indeed successful, what we're going to do is we're going to actually go back and print out the value of our secret. I'm also going to add a new line character here, right, so we can uh, space things apart. The thing is, if this printout gives us 500, this proves to us that this operation here has indeed overwritten our secret. So let's give that a try. We run it, and there you go, as you can see, now our secret has turned into 500, right? We tried to print out the value of secret here, and we realized that it has changed. So yeah, this has been a very simple example of us, you know, trying to overrun the bounds of an array, and in doing so, actually find a variable we could change up. To better understand what's actually happening under the hood, what we can do is we can actually show where all the positions are. So now I'm actually doing a slightly different kind of print statement, in which I actually want to see addresses, not the actual values. So let's start by printing ourselves the address of A. When we actually compile this, what we will see is something like this. So this just tells us the exact position in RAM in which the variable A is stored. We can also then print out the position of our secret variable. Of course, in this case, I need to write the ampersand, you know, to basically say I want the position instead of the actual value. Notice, of course, that, well, the position of this is fairly close by. And that's why as we traversed forwards, we were eventually able to find, well, our secret variable. Now that we've seen these two numbers, we can actually sort of prove that, you know, the trial and error we've just done is correct. Now, let's go back and actually look at these two addresses. Right, the distance between you know the start of array A and the actual secret variable itself would be 3c minus 1 0. This of course is in hexadecimal, so let's go ahead and do the subtraction. Basically, this number we get here, which if I were to convert the decimal real quick, is how far these two variables are apart in memory, and the answer being 44 bytes. So the position of secret right, is 44 bytes after the beginning of array A. Now, because we're dealing with integers here, and every integer is 4 bytes, what we can then do is we can divide this number by 4. And this tells us that basically, we have to search 11 integers ahead of A to find the secret. And that is exactly the number we've figured out through trial and error. If you start at A, you go forward by 11 integers, which basically equates to 44 bytes, you will find secret. And that's what our math has just proven. So yeah, that has been a very simple attack in which we just traverse beyond the boundaries of our array. And we see that, well, because no automatic bound checking actually takes place, it seems to be completely okay for us to do that. However, as it turns out, this isn't sort of your most basic buffer overflow attack because we aren't really using an overflow. To see this in action, usually we will be using a function that actually writes to an array and doesn't actually check the bounds. So it can actually sort of go over the bounds, right? So that is where the sort of overflow aspect of things actually happens. 
The most classic example of this is the string copy function, where it basically takes an array of characters, which is basically a string, and it copies it onto another array. The problem is, you can take a very long string, copy it to a very short array, and it will still work, but it will end up overwriting things outside the array. Let's see how dangerous this actually is. So I have gone ahead and wiped the program clean so we can start basically fresh. Let's first take a look at our string copy function used in a normal context. Here's the What I have here is my string 1, and let's say we call this string A. Now we're going to go ahead and create our second string here. In fact, you know what? Let's actually use the same number system, right, with our variable names, right? So string 1 and string 2 in variables with the same names, so as to not confuse you. What I can then say is string copy. What this function does is you first have to specify the target, right? So let's say I want to copy string 2 into string 1, so I have to say string 1 first, right? You start with the target, and then you start with the contents you actually want to move in to that string. After I've said this, I can then go ahead and actually print out my string 1, and you'll see that, you know, it has changed. So to do this, we're going to do another printf statement. This time we say percent %s, which means we want to print out a string. And since string 1 is the one that has been overridden, we go ahead and say string 1, which means, of course, we want to print out string 1. So we'll go ahead and compile this. And yeah, as you can see, when we print out string 1, it says string 2, right? So that proves to us that this function has taken effect. Now, here's the problem. If I were to make this string short, what this means is, well, C is only going to allocate basically three spaces for the string, right? One for H, one for I, and one for a null character that says the string has ended. What this means is when I try to copy this content into string one, I am putting far too much information into string one. I've only allocated three spaces, but there are, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine characters on the string. Now, at face value, this may actually work. See, you do actually get back your string too. But the problem is, well, you have actually overwritten some things in RAM that you were not supposed to overwrite. So in order to see this in action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of uh, amplify the effects of this a little bit by first making the string a little bit longer. So let's just say string 2, here is some text. Uh, yeah, let's just make it a little bit longer, right? And then I'm also going to build an additional array. So this will be the things that we're going to try and get overwritten. So uh, let's just put, say, 10 items in this array, right? Like so. Basically, let's just take a look at where everything is positioned relative to each other. So something like this will actually show us the position of each of these things. So basically the idea is this, at least when you know the program runs on my computer, basically the later you create a variable, the further back in RAM it goes. But what's important is our string 1 is very tiny, and then our array A comes directly after it. So that makes this ideal when we actually write string 2 into string 1. It's probably going to run over and overwrite some things in our array A. So with this picture in mind, let's go ahead and uh, switch the string copy back on. And what we're going to do is we're going to write a little loop. So this loop is going to basically iterate over the array and just print out each item inside. Right, so we'll go through the array, right, go from 0 to 9, and yeah, just print out everything. Again, we're going to do this with the string copy off first. And of course, that should give us all the values as we would expect. But with the string copy on, that's not going to be what happens anymore. See, we've actually overridden quite a few of the values with very strange numbers. So there you go, this is where an actual overflowing happens. You have an array that is supposed to be short, you write too much information into it, and it basically overflows from the sort of right bound of the array to go ahead and overwrite something else that it shouldn't have touched. And yeah, there you go, right? Now you can see the values actually being destroyed, overwritten. And there you go, that has been a buffer overflow attack. Now. 
What is one very simple way to safeguard ourselves against it? What we can do is we can actually use what is known as a canary. The idea is if we have a variable that we know sort of sits in a place that is vulnerable to this attack, and we set its value once and never change it again, if we actually see that value change at the end of the day, this tells us that a buffer overflow attack could have happened. Let's try and implement this in our latest example and see how it all pans out. So let's see our canary in action. Now, to implement a canary correctly, you do need to sort of have some understanding of where all the variables are going to end up. Now, we saw earlier on that basically, the earlier you create a variable, the further back it goes. With this pattern in mind, what we can do is, well, this is the right place to actually introduce your canary. So let's basically, well, see this in action, right? We're going to get rid of uh, most of our code here first. And we're going to basically print out the position of our string one, right? So just add a new line character here. And then we're going to also see the position of our canary. So let's go ahead and compile this. And you can see that basically, well, our canary exists just a short distance away from our array. So what this means is it's at a prime position to actually detect to see whether a buffer overflow has happened. So, um, well, we can actually take out this loop, right? This isn't super important now. Basically, since we have this number fixed at this, we now need to check to see if, well, the number has changed. So if it's not that number, then we can basically just display a message, right? I smell a buffer overflow, exclamation point. So the idea is if we don't actually do the string copy, you know what, let's print the values out. If we don't actually do the string copy, then you don't see the message, your data is intact. However, if we were to actually put the string copy back, then when you run this, because the canary has changed, you can now say that, you know, you think there is a buffer overflow. And in fact, well, you made the right call, right? Because our data has indeed been hit. So yeah, that's the idea of a canary. It's a value that you've set once and you expect it to stay constant. If it does not stay constant, it basically indicates that something was amiss, something has gone wrong. So yeah, like I said, in order for this to work correctly, you do have to put it at a place in which, well, a buffer overflow would hit it easily. If it ends up in a position that is nowhere near an array, then, well, your canary isn't very useful. So yeah, that's the idea, right? If a variable has changed, if our canary has been affected, we know that something wrong has happened. And there you go, that has been buffer overflow in a nutshell. Now, I actually call this buffer attacks because overflow is not the only thing you can do. If you remember not too long ago, there has been an attack called the hard bleed attack. That is an attack in which we try to read out many more bytes than we are actually supposed to have. So what this means is we are trying to create a very large buffer, but only filling in just a few letters worth. And as a result, we get to see more things in RAM than we were supposed to see. There is a very clear XKCD comic that actually describes this, so I'm just going to link that, right? It's a very interesting exploit, and a very simple one at that. So yeah, if you're interested in know more, you should definitely check that out. Now, you might be thinking, well, why is this a problem, right? In sort of modern day programming languages, bounds checking are kind of automatic. Well, you're right. For the most part, most programming languages do actually take some sort of, you know, defensive measures against this from happening. And even in programming languages like C, what has been rolled out is something called string n copy. And essentially what it's doing is you get to set sort of what's the maximum size of your buffer. And as a result, that will enforce not sort of going past the boundary. However, it remains a fact that we should understand some of the basic issues that could arise so that when they do, we know how to guard ourselves against it. And not to mention, it also guides you towards using your tools correctly. That is, even for something like string and copy, you know, if you decide to populate n with the size of the input string, 
Well, you're not using the function right. You are still opening up a safe function to, well, the possibility of a buffer overflow attack. So yeah, what that means is a safe function isn't necessarily safe if you don't actually use it correctly. Which is why, again, the basic understanding is so important. But yeah, that is basically it for our Random Wednesday episode. Hopefully you've gained some insight today. Like I said, buffer overflow is a very classic attack. So yeah, you'll definitely hear about it a lot, you know, if you take, say, a course in CS. But again, that's it. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.